As a mystic, you see how things change first in the inner. There is a law that everything that happens in life first constellates on the inner planes. For example, this movie you are doing first constellated as an idea inwardly. It was given to you as an idea. It came from somewhere within. In the spring of 2002, I think we all had a lot on our minds, but why the idea to make an independent film? I don't know. So, since I have no idea how to make a movie, I figure I'm going to need some help. So he lays this out on me, let's make a movie, and of course, I say yes. Yeah, yeah, and that's just, it's brilliant, just brilliant. If you're, if you're going to make a film, ask your cousin and your best friend, who has no history of filming or editing or acting or making movies at all. If we had known back then what was going to be involved in this project, I don't think we'd have had the courage to have taken it on. And maybe that's true of a lot of life's journeys. When we first started the project, we, we said we wanted no fear and no attachment. No fear of saying that, you know, someone's not going to like it. No attachment by saying that it should be something. And the um, reality is that it, you can't um, really do that. So with our camera in our hand, we head out into the world. And as I look back now, I have to question myself. Why? Why did we possibly think we would gain access to noteworthy people who would help us with this project? Why would a group of guys from Detroit with absolutely no experience in filmmaking possibly think we would be able to meet, let alone interview, some of the world's greatest priests and rabbis and imams? But they came forward. As I look at their faces now, I'm amazed. Indian yogis, masters from the East, African kings, they volunteered to help us with this project. We were joined by Catholic monks and Buddhist nuns, Native American medicine men, great minds, cultural icons, authors, celebrated thinkers, people working at a very high level on the international stage and they gave of themselves to us without qualifying us, without asking us who we were or what our credentials were, knowing only that our project was about oneness. And the power of that energy alone, they opened the doors and they let us in. And so I think it's important as we tell this story, as we tell the story of this movie and the story of this journey, that we honor all of that love and positive energy that these wonderful people gave to us. And I hope we can do that. Describe what happens to a person after they die. What is everyone afraid of? What is heaven? How does one obtain truth? What stands on the way of world peace? Where is war justified? What is it that does not allow people to live to their full potential? What is the meaning of life? Meaning of life. Can you remember and begin to see the nebulas of our thoughts birthing atoms, molecules, this golden web of life that is silent, it's eternal, it is Shimmering. You and I, we are nothing but a tapestry of dreams. Each I mean, we had to remember, we're just a couple of guys trying to make a movie in a basement in Michigan. Yeah, we found out we couldn't do what they do in Hollywood. So we decided to go back to the basics. And our new beginning for the film came in the form of a simple, beautiful woman, Sister Eveline, who with three words gave us a new start to the movie. Growth entails healing. At this, at this time in humanity, most people have been hurt fairly seriously 
in their gro in the growth process, and unless they, unless they do their healing, and work through this negativity, they will never become totally who they are. incident in the area in the past two months. Three people are reported dead as the result of an early morning shooting spree outside a downtown bar. Police are holding two men in custody. The Ambassador Bridge has reopened after what officials describe as a credible terrorist threat. Details following this report from Washington. You are listening to the Bob Duco Show on 103.5 FM WMUZ The Light. Fearlessly defending the faith with you as always. A little bit of a departure from our regular Free for All Friday. This is where we're giving you folks a chance to participate in this documentary that's being put together. The first interview that we did was about five weeks after we had gotten the camera in the mail, and it was at a Christian radio station. It was on a Christian radio talk show, the Bob Duco Show, and he actually put us on the air. Where are several questions being asked from a lot of different people from a lot of different cultures. They're going to be asking these questions. Of the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Muslims and the atheists and the Hare Krishnas and everybody else. And they're also asking them of the Christians. And guess what? They're going to be asking me a bunch of these questions in an interview after the show. But in the meantime, we're throwing out some of the questions to you and giving you a chance to participate with some of your thoughts on this. So the question on the table right now, if you were granted one wish, what would that one wish be? Let's get the Christian perspective on that. If you're granted one wish, what would that wish be? Off to the phones we go. We'll start with Rod in Belleville. Rod, hi, you're on the Bob Duco Show. Hi, Bob. I listen to your show, and I really enjoy it. Thanks, Rod. The one wish I have, and, and I'm a pastor in the Belleville area, is that everybody would come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's it. You know, that's the big kahuna, right? Everybody in the world, all six billion people, boom, let's go. Get on your knees, right? Would that be a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful thing? What an incredible thing that would be. <laughs> Two days later was our next stop. It was the summer solstice picnic of the Michigan chapter of the American Atheists. God is make-believe. God is fairy tales for adults. God is... Uh, a belief system that is not credible, has no evidence. God is just something that is made up so that people can deny the truth of death. We had just learned lesson number one. Oneness is not about being the same. It looked like things might get a little confusing. The all-encompassing smile gently says... God loves you. Oh, why smile? You don't even know me. Well, I don't want to sound so eccentric, but to be very, very honest with you, again, I have to realize that Jesus Christ is life. In St. John, the 14th chapter, he stated in the verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man me, cometh unto the um, Father there except is no by me. Sort of God. This is the only like, way. Uh, I grew up that Catholic, and if God. my school sees this, I'm fired because I teach in a Catholic school. But I don't believe in God, per se. Um, I believe in the kind of beautiful like goodness. The joke that the that theologians I tell, where little Johnny is asked by the preacher, uh, Johnny, do you know the meaning of faith? Do uh, you know what faith is? And he says, Sure, I do, preacher. He said, What is it? He says, Faith is believing what you know ain't true. 
walk in the path of God, Smile says. But again, I find myself trotting along the path of man. It's where I live, for crying out loud, directly linked and fully bonded with human Your soul. Your soul goes up to heaven. Comedy show, ladies, you need to go to the show. And what else? And all that baggage that comes with it, draped with human attributes, full of folly and foibles, so outlandish, no imagination could conjure them up. We're living in the last These days, are real stories. A lot of things are going on, like homelessness and you know, drugs, alcohol, and a lot of gang activity. I don't know, maybe it's hard to find work and things like that. So some countries are in the dump, some countries are up, some neighborhoods are in the dump, some neighborhoods are nice. So that's the answer to that question. Mr. Man with a nice shirt, what else? These are real stories unwinding in cities and towns all over the world, in many languages, through every culture, lives weaving their way like webs. that is torn, that is uh, far from bring, being whole, um, it's fractured. And uh, people who really care get depressed because there's a lot that is depressing. Uh, certainly we can gloss over it and deny it and suppress it and try to stay away from all of these painful things. But if we're really a, a citizen of the earth and connecting with what's going on, we have no alternative but to feel lots of pain. Stretching in all directions, mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, brothers and sisters, meeting friends of associates, until everybody falls into their roles with their responsibilities and obligations and schedules and appointments, cancellations, reappointments, classes, interviews, surveys, tests. Where did I come from? What's the meaning of my existence? Do I have a soul? What happens to me when I die? Does God exist? Does she care about me? These are the qualities that human beings have. You know, we are the only species that is aware of our mortality. And with that comes the great uh, desire to, to look into the unknown. If you're not totally amazed and bewildered and mystified by yourself, then you are still not fully human. Eventually, we were able to put a face on this struggle. It was a group of teens in the mountains of Colorado, and we had stopped and decided to try to do some street interviews. And we had asked one of the boys the same question that we had asked back in that radio station. And the honesty of his response said more than his words could ever say. If I had one wish for the world... Um, if I had one wish for the world, I would have everyone, I don't know, I'd have to think about that. I don't know. I wouldn't have a wish for the world. I don't, I don't think I would choose wish for the world. I don't think I'm worth it. <laughs> That's the truth. Several questions being asked from a lot of...
The original plan for the movie was just to do street interviews. We were going to get our camera and put together a list of questions and talk to people on the streets and try to get a broad cross-section of humanity answering these questions. Well, at some point we decided, let's try to get an interview with a famous person or a spiritual leader or an icon or an author. And so we sent out a few emails. And the first response that we got back was from Dr. Robert Thurman. Not only is he Uma Thurman's father, but he happens to be a great author, a professor, close personal friends with the Dalai Lama. He was the first American-born Tibetan Buddhist monk. And he's kind enough to invite us to his home in the Catskill Mountains. And, uh, he's never seen the questions, never heard the questions, so he's doing everything off the cuff. I mean, we're asking, describe God. Why is there poverty and suffering in the world? Why are so many people depressed? What happens to you after you die? And he's barraging us with this wealth of information and articulate thought. And it was an incredibly powerful interview that we were having. Well, question 17 was a little bit different. Question 17 was our nonverbal question, as we called it. And the question went like this. Nonverbally, by motion, gesture, or movement only, show or act out the condition of the world. Now at about this point, as the guy asking the questions, I start to think to myself, gee, I wonder what he's gonna do. Because it's kind of a bizarre question anyway, and we've gotten an awful lot of interesting responses, shall we say, to this question. Act out what you believe to be the current condition of the world. So there's Robert Thurman continuing to stare at me during this interview. And the next thought that I had was, oh my God, he thinks we're idiots. Well, it was fear because we had, we never ran the camera and we didn't know how to use the equipment and he was our first big interview. Uh, it was fear. And the reality is we did become fearful. I know I became very fearful during this part of our exchange. I was actually afraid to blink. I think fear is a very powerful emotion. What are we all so afraid of? Oh, we are afraid of our shadows. We're afraid we're not good enough to do certain things in life. We're afraid that uh, we might do something wrong. Um, we're just afraid of ourselves. We're afraid of ourselves. We're afraid of ourselves. We're afraid we're not worthy. We're, we're afraid we're not worth it. I think we're afraid of knowing who we truly are. We're afraid of uh, what this world might do to us. We are afraid of the darkness inside of us. We're afraid we're broken and failures and we'll be discovered and then, then we'll be shamed and shot. We're afraid of our power. We are afraid of our inherent dignity. What everyone is afraid of is just the simple process of life. Fear prevents people from living to their fullest potential. There is a price to pay to confront your own fears, your own anxieties, and to, to go deep within yourself. It is much easier to project it and to have enemies outside or people you dislike. Or, then you can project your problems and it's somebody else's fault. The, the ruthless, the ruthless will prevail. Whoever is the most ruthless in this situation is going to prevail. 
And if we pussyfoot around and want to love our enemies and stuff, we will lose. They will conquer us. And I think there's a couple billion, many too, pe uh, too many people in the world, and we have to eliminate the enemy. Anybody who wants to be a suicide bomber, we should kill their cousins, their aunts, their uncles, their mom, their dad, their brothers, their sisters. Three generations removed, kill them all. People don't like, some people don't like what I have to say because I don't have the peace-loving viewpoint. I believe it's kill or be killed. This is a war, and if you, is, that's the way it is. I've seen the rain today. The more interviews we conducted, the more themes began to emerge in the responses. And one prominent theme seemed to be fear. Thomas Merton, one of the greatest Christian mystics of the 20th century, once wrote, the root of war is fear. This was certainly a timely subject for our project. Spewing their unpatriotic rhetoric, these rebels are misinformed and in dire need of a history lesson. In 1945, the atomic bomb saved more lives than it took. Throughout civilization, nations and cultures have always clashed, with the superior army utilizing strategic initiatives, always winning. Anyone assuming everlasting peace on earth is being unrealistic and will certainly be unprepared when war touches their border. There are two kinds of ignorance. One is innate ignorance, which is born of the dualistic mind, me and the other, biological organism and the universe, mind and body. Our dualistic thinking leads to ignorance, and then sometimes we institutionalize our dualistic thinking. We call it religion, and then we go to war. God has anointed America as the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we need to baptize other nations. I would say that war is justifiable when our freedom is in jeopardy. That's what I'd say. No comment? No comment on that one. <laughs> I think war is justifiable in self-defense. Only in terms of defense. Self-defense. In self-defense. Did all living things have a right to defend and protect their lives? Uh, now, of course, people are always talking about defense, right? And really, it isn't defense. You know, we hear of the Defense Department, uh, and it's really a war department. And I believe that violence is wrong. If there is such a thing as a human sin, it is a sin to fall to violence. If I can do it with words, I'm going to do it with words. If I can do it with a chokehold, I'm going to do it with a chokehold. But if I need to do it with a bullet, I'll do it with a bullet. Come on, lay it on him. Give him the rope. Did I deal. think, yes, yeah, since a lot of our people have been killed, that we should go over there and bomb the shit out of them? I really do. Fear is like a plague. It's like a disease. And it has its way to infiltrate people's minds and to cause people to posture in a very unhealthy way. And when there is excessive fear, then even we begin to become the aggressors ourselves. The greatest way to ensure peace is through a higher military presence and the will to use that power when necessary. This is where I think the world religions have an important role. They themselves have been a, a principal source of violence over the centuries. And this has to stop. Uh, religions proclaim human values. They've got to work together. The root of the word religion is re-legare, to bind back and make whole, or to make one. And I think current religion is doing almost the opposite. It's amazing to me that the religious people of America are not standing up and screaming, you know? and yet we let our heads of state talk this way, the right of preemptive strike. Once that is set in motion, I don't think we have any idea what we've unleashed. Yeah? That as soon as human beings perceive the possibility of anything, which can largely be manufactured by our own fears, 
Uh, uh, we have a right to go kill first? I have on my puja table Christ and Buddha and my guru and many, many Buddhist monks. And I've got George, George W. on the table. And I say, hello, Buddha. Hello, Maharaji. Oh, hello, Krishna. Oh, hello, Georgia. <laughs> because we are the world's policemen, we have the authority to implement our rules of law and a duty to enforce them. And I know right there what my work to do is. <laughs> there's the, there's the, the work I have to do. And I can't free him until I don't, I'm free. He's, and we can't, we are mirrors of, we are mirrors of each other. By the practice of deep listening and uh, gentle speech, uh, we can help remove the wrong perceptions in us and in them. And this is the basic um, practice in order to bring peace. And our political leaders have to learn how to do that. So if each individual, especially a politician <laughs> or the world leaders, as like in our country, in America, you know, the leader of the nation can defeat these enemies, hatred, selfish desire, and ignorance, we have no war outside. Jihad is the holy war. Now, it is said there is the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. And the greater jihad is the war against the nafs, one's own lower self. And anybody who embarks upon any serious spiritual quest has to conquer their lower nature. The holy war, kind of strange name, but it's the war against the worst enemy of all. The war against our bad side. So everything comes back to consciousness. From our thoughts, it produces our words. From our words, it produces our actions. We must watch our actions because it produces our habits. Our habits produce our character. And our character produces our culture. So we have so much of a violent culture. We have so much of uh, inauspicious habits because our thoughts are so much based on fear and violence and aggression. Any country that develops nuclear capabilities, harbors terrorists, violates human rights, or threatens our way of life, must be held accountable. That's when war is justifiable, is when yeah. they hurt us? Is yeah, saying? is when they hurt us and they kill our innocent people. I mean, look how many people died in... in Who's to say what's innocent? But, you know, it's all in one perspective. We need to look at life much more closely, the global situation much more closely. Why certain people are aggressive? Why per certain people are willing to shed their own lives just to cause a little misery to somebody else. Something must be making them so desperate to do it. Does this action have anything, anything, even ten percent message here that we have to learn? I think you can't get rid of the pain until you learn its lessons. God wants us to work for justice and to deal with causes of the problem and uh, to bring understanding among humanity and to fight poverty and injustice and oppression that are causes of many, many problems in this world. There is great inequity in the world, a lot of imbalance. 80% of the world's resources are consumed by less than 20% of the world's people. When fundamental needs are not met, then the reaction to that is violence. Actually, it's not even violence in the beginning. In the beginning, it's uh, shock and numbness and denial and fear and panic. And only later does this turn to anger and violence and retribution and then the whole cycle starts to perpetuate itself.
so here we are, the inheritors of the whole of creation, so to speak, the whole of evolution at least, uh, with an intelligence that's somewhat impaired by the fact that we have come to this place largely through competition, violence, selfishness. And we haven't learned yet that uh, happiness is going to be found not in fighting each other, but in, in, in joining hands and trying to climb out of this uh, swamp of human selfishness that we find ourselves in instead of fighting over the real estate. The magic of the movie was more than just getting great interviews. It was people coming forward and helping with camera work and production help and even things like music for a soundtrack. Michael Fitzpatrick is a world-renowned cellist and he traveled with the Dalai Lama and wrote this music for him that they call Compassion. Well, one day, about four months into the project, we get a box in the mail and it's the Compassion CD from Michael Fitzpatrick with the rights to use the music. And speaking over the music is the Dalai Lama himself talking about compassion. Genuine compassion is uh, irrespective of what others' attitude towards you. But so long as the others also just like myself, as you want happiness, you do not want suffering, and also have the right to overcome suffering. On that basis, you see, develop some kind of sense of concern. Now, that is the genuine compassion. Now, unbiased, even towards your enemy, so long that enemy also the uh, human being or some other form of human being. So they also have the right to overcome suffering. So on that basis, you see the uh, con sense of concern. That's just compassion. Somewhere in the suffering, the poverty, the distress in this world, there is some lesson, some experience that people need. Probably the most important quality humans possess is compassion. To feel with, to be in solidarity, solidarity with other people's pain and to let it become my pain. I think uh, evil is the absence of consciousness, of empathy, uh, of being able to feel with another. If you allow yourself to be vulnerable and let the pain in, once you let the pain in, you can't be a hard ass anymore. You just can't. Do you understand? A big pocket to come and big pocket my money. The money I work so hard. And then I cannot love the big pocket. I cut his hand and I look deep in his eye. Who, 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 who is your father? I don't know. The big pocket doesn't. Who is your mother? Mother is there. Instead of slapping the big pocket in a very superficial way, you just keep his hand, look deeper and cry about him. And when you inquire him, you understand him deeply. That is Vipassana. And when you understand deeply one thing, two things, slowly everybody will become Buddha. If we'd seen Jesus as a living message of human vulnerability, I think that quality could save the world. And this land will become the land of God.
We were about a year and a half into the project when another really rare interview opportunity presented itself to us. In 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize a young Vietnamese monk named Thich Nhat Hanh. Please call me by my two names so I, can, so I can wake up. So the door of my heart will be left open, the door of compassion. Over the next 40 years, Thich Nhat Hanh went on to become a real major figure on the world stage of spiritual thought and a renowned Buddhist teacher. It was during one of his rare visits to the United States that he learned of our project and agreed to meet with us and share his thoughts. Well, the plan was to study with him for three days. And at the end, he'd answer some of our questions. But after the three days, we found out that there were a bunch of other groups that wanted to talk to him as well. But despite these demands on his time, for whatever reason, he walks over, sits down in front of our little camera setup, and spends 20 minutes with us. And what I thought was interesting was when I asked him one of the questions about living in the present moment, he answered the question with a story. Uh, a man riding on a horse. He seems to be in a very hurry. And a friend of his uh, standing by the sidewalk, uh, calling on him, where are you going? And the man on the horse said, I don't know, you ask the horse. It means that we are not, we do not know where we go. We allow the situation to carry us away. We are not in control of ourselves. We do not live our own life in the here and the now. Carl Jung says, and I think he's right, that 95% of people live 95% of their life unconscious. They're just on a conveyor belt. They can be bought off very easily. We see this, how the media can almost create any mentality at once in America, usually within a week. And we're all, and we think we're intelligent people. Huh? But you can tell there's no ground or center in here. And whatever the dominant consciousness tells us to believe, we by and large believe. Uh, bread and circuses was the, the name in the Roman period that the Roman people could be kept unconscious by just keep giving them enough bread and entertaining them in the Colosseum. Bread, bread and, and circus of media. Television is a drug. Television is the new church. Uh, and it sucked our brains into the TV tube. And what it's done is created a matrix where people are totally uh, stupefied and distracted from the world around them and a belief that they could change it. We think we're the mind that is miserable and that is anxious and that wants and desires. So we chase it and we become anxious. Settle down. Relax. Go inside. Meditate. Doesn't matter what religion. Meditate and still your mind. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this moment. It's complete. If you could live in this moment, then you would be okay. But you're either living in the past or in the future. And we can say about both of them, they're not here. People are always suffering, either what happened yesterday or what may happen tomorrow. So your suffering is always about that which does not exist, simply because you're not rooted in reality. You're always rooted in your mind. mind is one part of it is memory, another part of it is imagination. Both of them are in one way imagination, because both of them don't exist right now. According to Jewish tradition, living in the present moment is the only moment we have. Because uh, as I may have mentioned, Judaism does not have a concrete concept of, of an afterlife. We don't know for sure that there is an afterlife. Mm -hmm. Describe what happens to a person after they die. <laughs> yeah. 
In what certainly was one of our most interesting interviews, we were able to actually get a first-hand answer to this question about what happens to a person after they die. We met a woman named Barbara Brodsky, and about 30 years ago, she lost her hearing. And in her deafness, she began to come into contact with a disembodied spirit. His name is Aaron, and using Barbara as his channel, he answered our question about the afterlife. I am Aaron. My blessings and love to you. The question, what happens to a person after they die? Death is safe. You have all done it many times. If it wasn't safe, you wouldn't be here. The experience of dying. It's like being underwater for too long, so your lungs are gasping for breath. There's pressure against your body. This is the life experience. And then you come up into that sweet air. Suddenly you're free of the pressure and constraint. Death is like that moment of emerging into the sweet air. It's very peaceful. When you die, you go on to a, um, a, a soul village. When we die, we go over to Indian camp, Indian villages, that part of the spirit world. If you're a white person, you go to a European camp or a European village or a European spirit world. Well, I like to believe that depending on how you were in during. your life, yeah, during your life, you go to heaven or hell, unfortunately. But I like to think that everyone's going to go to heaven because God loves us all. The trick is we have to accept Jesus as our Savior, and then we get into heaven through his perfect blood that washes us clean. So I don't get into heaven on my own good works. I don't get into heaven because of what I did good. Because anything that I do is not good enough to get me into heaven. If you're black, Afro-American, you would go to that kind of cultural World. The Bible says that people would be judged according to their actions. So those who have done something good, they will go to internal life. Those who have done something bad while here on earth will go to internal hell. If you're Asian, you would go to the Asian spirit world. So some religions said God loves poor people. If you suffer this life, your next life reward is great. And in a thousand said that is bullshit. So in a Tao believe that we have to be happier. You can enjoy your life, enjoy your sex, enjoy your eating, enjoy until you the end of your big your life that you want to separate. And that is the heaven. I'm not sure that heaven exists, and as I, uh, I, I don't think I really care. I believe I'd like to live in this world, uh, in this life assuming that it is the only life and the only world that I will ever have access to. It's heaven all the way to heaven. Uh, it's, it's whenever you can accept anything, which is to accept everything in, in the right now. That's a little moment of heaven. The one, the one. The one, the one, this is all the manifestation of the one. It manifests in cosmos, nature, in all the qualities of nature, in the poeticness uh of the natural world. The one is creative. Look at it, it's creative. Look at it, it's creative and butterflies and in seagulls and rivers and mountains. And Heaven has not yet been created. And when it is created, it will be a place where everything and anything you wish for is right there for you. I've, you know, to be honest with you, I've not thought about heaven. Not in the pie in the sky, the traditional way, the way I was raised where they say, well, you know, if you're a good girl, you know, you'll go to heaven and be above the clouds and, you know, at the pearly gates and all that. I don't happen to believe in all of that. Almost nobody literally believes in the heaven of infinite youth 
of seeing all of the people who have gone before you that you want to see, of endless meals and joys and repetition of all the successes you have had and elimination of all the failures in a world where the rain is gentle and the sun shines occasionally but when you want it to and when there are flowers everywhere. Fragrances of flowers and plants and human beings and in the innocence of children and laughter in selfless actions uh, in the stars in our dreams our psychological processes. And when everyone smiles at you and you return the smile. Heaven can be here. Heaven to me would be here on earth. Everything is a manifestation of the divine. The divine is there. If we have the awareness, we can perceive it. So it's not a place elsewhere. It's here. This is nirvana. We're in nirvana. But we're like, we're enjoying, we're very bad at enjoying it. <laughs> we, we make it into a struggle when actually it, it is a bliss. So when you... <laughs> when you be here now. <laughs> now, instead of always thinking about the future or what happened in the past, but dealing with the moment and what's going on with you now. Uh, or we say, as Africans say, saying, in the sasa, so right now. You're getting very, very close to God. Hmm. So it seems like in some strange way, this all leads us back to the Catskill Mountains. So after wondering what he was going to do, and then being afraid of what he thought of us, as we continued with our eyes locked, I was suddenly overcome with a sense of the present moment. This powerful sense that I was a 45-year-old man making a movie of all things, sitting on the top of a mountain on a summer afternoon with Dr. Robert Thurman. And I knew in that moment that this journey had great meaning. During the course of this project, we ask a lot of people a lot of questions. But it seemed like the one question that caused people the most pause, that gave people the most trouble, was the ultimate question. The meaning of life is, to say in few words, Meaning of life. Um, God, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, We're here because of that, that big question. What is the meaning of life? The question is actually absurd. Um, God. But for me, uh, I couldn't tell you. I have, I have never really thought about that. I, I don't know enough to answer that question. Uh, I don't, <laughs> I can't answer that, that's too, 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 too tough. I, I couldn't really tell you the meaning of it. I don't know. I don't, I don't know, I can't answer that. I don't know why we're here. Cheers. <laughs> trying to happen here Something is being born Like a phoenix rising out of the ash Something is being born I think the meaning of life is you do whatever you want no matter what people say Just to live your life to the fullest 
just live the life, do what you want to do. And if a person tells you that you suck and that you can't do it, I believe to prove them wrong, and that will that will be the meaning, the meaning of, of your life. life. Is not to look to look back, you know, to enjoy that moment, you know, to the best way to describe the, the meaning of life, of life is, is uh, to to be good people and enjoy yourself and take care of others and. Just be good, you know? That's, to me, that's the meaning of good life. To find the real meaning is to find love. Love. Christ is love. Buddha is love. Krishna is love. There is a great power giving us life, and that gives us meaning to find that great power. What is the meaning of life? It is what is the meaning of life to you. Because for me it is different to you. Because each of us is unique, each of us is different, each of us has a unique note to play. All of us are just this huge massive puzzle, like massive puzzle. Each one of us is a different piece. And that's our, that's our I. That I am a part of everything else that's here. And so the meaning for life is that we all have a role. And I'm trying to define what my role is. And if I know what my role is, I know what the meaning of life is for me. Carl Jung, he said, find the meaning and make the meaning your goal. Just like Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. The meaning of life is to experience the divine potential within you, say yes to it totally, and actualize it on the behalf of all life. The meaning has to be made here in my relations with other people collectively, what we make of this earth and of all the people who live together, that's what makes the meaning of life. And there is no point in you trying to follow my meaning or me trying to follow your meaning. The thing is, is that you need to be able to understand your little piece and see what you look like and also see all the pieces around you so that you can see how you fit in without trying to mimic all the pieces or change your piece. Because we are each unique, we are a unique creation. A butterfly doesn't try to become a tree. And then you've got the part of you that's connected, which is the little edges of the pieces of the puzzle, correct? God is found in the interconnections between people. And the discovery of every person that I meet is a discovery and meeting of God. As we look back now, having completed all of the interviews, it seems like the meaning of the project wasn't found in the answers that we got. It was found in the people that we met, the people that came forward, and they became like partners to us in some strange way. Maybe the best example of that is Llewellyn Vaughn Lee. He's this great Sufi mystic who invites us to his retreat in Northern California. And while we were there, he answered the question, what is the meaning of life? But when he was answering the question, it was as though he was talking directly to us about having come together for the project. And what he said was, when your meaning and, and my, my meaning, meaning for a moment, moment intersect. intersect. And then we are outside of space, outside of time, and we are working together in a totally different way that, has, that affects not just you or me, but the whole. And that is very meaningful. <laughs>
What is the meaning of life? The meaning of life is to... As a Christian, to me, the meaning of life is to know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. The meaning of life is to make a decision where you are going to spend eternity, plain and simple. The meaning of life is to be obedient to your God. To worship Him, to, serve, to praise Him. Those who deviate from His path, they are dead, even if they call themselves alive. He is a God of judgment, He is a God of wrath, and a God of consequences. Um, let me think about that. If there is a God, I don't want to believe in Him unless He accepts all of us, instead of condemning the ones, the ones He wants to. Describe God. Describe? Describe God. Describe what? Describe God. I didn't get you. Brahma. Describe God? Oh. <laughs> Describe God. <laughs> Describe God, you can't. It is a ludicrous question. Good meaning of God, when people mean, when they say God is love, like in the Christian scriptures, or when the Muslims say Allah Rahman, God the merciful, if they mean by that, that sort of the power of love is the power of the universe that isn't necessarily a person, doesn't have a plan, and also love doesn't necessarily control the beloved, it just wishes for the happiness of the beloved. So it's sort of an, a, a happiness energy that wishes for beings to be happy. If God is defined that way, then there's no question any religious person of any kind, whether they're theistic or monotheistic or not, they would agree with that uh, definition. The personal definition, like the angry God, the God of this tribe, that sort of thing, those things are, are a little bit problematic from, a, from an enlightened point of view. The great mystics of all the great world religions, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, none of them are afraid of God. Huh? God is not a person. Is not some sort of character who sits in a chair or something. God is certainly not a dead white male in the sky. He's not like some big old white dude sitting up there on a diamond gem throat that's thrown, thrown, you know, with a long beard, you know, looking, uh, you know, all elegant and uh, snooty and looking down on people. When you say describe God, you have a firm assumption that there is somebody sitting up there. This assumption has created enormous pain and suffering to human beings on this planet. So if there is something called creator, if there is a force or a person or a thing which is creating all this, where can it be? Are you quick? See, he listens. The creator is everywhere, it's like I said. The Muslims say that God is closer than your jugular. He is closer to us than this vein here. And God is certainly closer to me than my jugular vein. He is closer to us than our hearts. And God is to be found in the heart of every living entity, as well as in all the atoms. Smaller than the smallest. One could say smaller than an atom or an electron, and greater than the greatest, greater than the whole universe, is the divine reality. That God is in everything, everything is God, everything is a part of God. We call the Wu Qi, the nothingness, the center of the universe. So in a Taoism, we don't give them a name of God. Tell them that God is not out there. God is beyond even our idea of the beyond. You can't describe it, you can only feel it. The real goal is something much more amazing, you know. It's much more fantastic. Like a phoenix rising out of the ash. Someone waking up. What is the meaning of life?
And so, about three years ago, we set out on this odyssey with nothing but a DV camera, 20 questions, and a mantra. We are all one. But what began as kind of a lark amongst friends to try to make an independent film, somewhere along the way, turned into a life's journey. And what started out back then as a kind of kumbaya notion of oneness also grew into something much greater. Somewhere along the way, oneness became more colorful. It's 100% a fact that we are all one. Look, if you went to the moon and you looked from the moon at the earth, you would see one earth. You wouldn't see white people, black people, red people, monkeys, ants, flowers, bees, water, air, rain, non-rain, desert. You wouldn't see all of this. You would see one earth. Ontological, astrological, beyond energy, beyond light, beyond sound, beyond perception, beyond mind. We are all one. And oneness became more intense. But just imagine for a moment that you looked around the room right now, wherever you're sitting, and you saw that that vase of flowers, that window, that microphone, that camera, is it's like looking at yourself and how you would feel about those things <clears throat> and those people if you knew for, for a moment with great certainty that that was true. And I think the answer is right there. And oneness became more inclusive. And so We Are One is an exploration of discovering that the oneness is in paradoxically in the multiplicity, plurality. Despite the fact that we have, we have a lot of differences in terms of ethnicities, ethnicities and nationalities and different traditions and in terms of our ge geographical location. The Israelis and the Palestinians. Bosnia, Chechnya, Pakistan. Iraq and the We are American, we are Dutch, we are German. Jews and the Palestinians, the Christians and Muslims. Arabs, Buddhist, a Hindu, a Jew, a Muslim, an animist, an atheist. East, west, north, south, up and down. All people. There are hundreds of languages, probably hundreds of races that exist in our world today. We, the fact remains that we are all one. We are all one. We are one. Nahnu kulluna muwahadun. And oneness became more internal. Ask yourself, who am I? What do I want? And if you go really deep into this, who am I? Very deep into this, you'll realize you're not your body, you're not the mind, you're not even your personality. You're the infinite being. And oneness became richer and more beautiful than we could have ever imagined. We are all unique, each one of us different. And it's so wonderful that we are different. We may spring from the same oneness of our interiority, but as human beings, as individuals, every one of us is unique. We are different, that's what is beautiful about us. So at least let's enjoy the difference. If you learn to enjoy the difference, if you see that every human being is a unique human being. Only once, in the whole eternity, only once this kind of human being happens. You cannot find exactly this kind of human being anywhere else in the existence, at any time in eternity, only once. That is true with yourself, with your friend, with your enemy, with your loved ones and the ones you hate, all of them are absolutely unique. Anything that you see as unique, you value it. Anything that you value, you will have no problems with it. And oneness will happen out of that. If you begin to enjoy the uniqueness of life, oneness will happen out of that. On the last day of the last interview 
after the final question had been asked, we were sitting in a remote monastery with Father Thomas Keating. Now, he's probably the most revered figure in the Christian contemplative movement today. And we were talking with him about the journey of this movie. And on the final minute of almost 100 hours of tape, he summarizes the journey this way. The beginning of the spiritual journey is, is the realization, not just the information, but a real interior conviction that there is a higher power or God, or to make it as easy as possible for everybody, that there is an other capital O. Second step, to try to become the other, still a capital O. And finally, the realization that there is no other. You and the other are one. Always have been, always will be. You just think that you aren't. To give you a chance to answer them. So right now, for our remaining few minutes, get online because here's the question, and I want to know your answer to this. What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? How do you answer that question without going to find some guru sitting on top of a mountain with a white beard and sitting in a yoga position? You know what I'm talking about. It is our work, the work of you who are making this film, the work of the people who are watching the film, to bring this next level of evolution into being. My name is Deepak Chopra. what I'll do when I grow up. Why are so many people depressed? the game isn't as much fun as they thought it was going to be. <laughs> this particular Sufi tradition, which is known as the Naqshbandi Sufi tradition, we're known as the silent Sufis, because we practice a silent meditation. tradition goes back to the 13th, 14th century in the Middle East. How's that? What is our greatest distraction? Our greatest distraction? Take care. Have a nice weekend. All right. Thanks for calling. Bye. Greatest distraction is the telephone. We, are we going to have to do something about that? <laughs> you bet we are, wouldn't you? I have not seen a fly <laughs> for months. We don't have a lot of flies. We'll take this as a bad omen.
He will keep reappearing. No, no, I don't th even think we have a fly swatter. What is the meaning of life? <laughs>
dawn of time We gotta learn to live together Each and every day And if you could see what I see We might find a way Cause I know that we are different But inside we're all the same And someday you're gonna realize We're playing the same game If you are a mile in my shoes A mile in my shoes Do you think your eyes would open And see another view If you walk a mile in my shoes would you be so cavalier with the words that you choose? And would you be so quick to pull it aside? Someone who's not like you. Not if you are the mile, a mile in my shoes. Oh, oh. I'm just trying to get my life straight Doing things in my way And if you would only listen There might come a day When you don't only think of me As a smaller man than you But an equal part of a bigger plan That's gonna see us through oh, I'm violent in my shoes Think your eyes would open and see another view if you walked a mile in my shoes. Would you be so cavalier with the words that you choose? And would you be so quick to put aside someone who's not like you? Not if you walked a mile. What's true And if we start seeing eye to eye You'll see the real you It's really nothing new If you walk the line in my shoes Do you think your eyes would open And see another view If you walk Shoot.